Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. So the other day I published my Ask Me Anything video that I publish every single month. This is a members only video where you can ask me whatever you want and I'll do my best to help. Here John asked me three very interesting questions that a lot of you might also like to know. What is my video production tech stack? What is my game development tech stack? And what is my web dev tech stack? I have to say that having good tools will make your life so much easier. Remember how you don't have to reinvent the wheel. In fact, you really shouldn't. One example of some advice that I always give is whether or not you should make your own game engine. And my answer is very much you should choose between do you want to make an engine or do you want to make a game? Because you probably can't do both because making a game engine is an insane amount of work. So you might as well use a tool, might as well use a game engine that someone has already made and really just use that to make your own game. And same thing for how you should use good tools. If you try editing a video on something like Windows Movie Maker, chances are it's going to be an insane amount of work and the output is not going to be very good. So it's also very important to use good tools. But at the same time, with that said, you don't need the best tool of all. You don't need the absolute perfect setup. Getting something done is much better than getting it done perfectly. Something that just works can be perfectly fine as we will soon see when I talk about my web dev tech stack. Here I'll tell you all the tools that I use for these three separate tasks, as well as talking about alternatives in case you don't want to use the exact tools that I use. So first of all, my game dev tech stack. Now I've been making games for over a decade at this point. I started off making games with Flash back in 2008, and then in 2012 I transitioned into Unity. Flash was really awesome, I definitely really enjoyed working with Flash, but suddenly it ended up dying. Apple decided that Flash would not run on iPhones, so that kind of killed technology. Even though all the games that I did during my Flash era, those definitely taught me quite a lot. So even though the technology itself died, the tool itself died, I still kept a lot of knowledge as I transitioned into Unity. I made that switch back in 2012 when I found Unity. Back then, Unity was pretty much the only free option, so that was basically the default option that I had. Back then, I believe Godot did not exist at all. Game Maker, I think, was paid, and Unreal was definitely paid. So back then, Unity was pretty much my only choice. And I have since published nine successful games on Steam, covering a wide range of genres. So up here, John asked me, so what's your game development tech stack? And over here, I said Unity and Visual Studio, mostly. So Unity is my game engine of choice, but that's really just one engine. There are many possible options. Nowadays, you can use Godot, you can use Unreal, you can use Game Maker. Thankfully, nowadays, pretty much every engine is excellent. So if you want to make games, you've got all kinds of tools, all of them excellent, all of them will enable you to build pretty much any game you can think of. One fun recent hyper successful example is Bellatro. This game made millions upon millions of dollars. And this one is actually made with an engine or rather a framework called Love2D. So yep, there's all kinds of tools you can use for making games. And me personally, I use Unity. That's the one that I prefer. Then for writing the code itself, I use Visual Studio, the community edition. This one is completely free. Honestly, I use very little of the Visual Studio features. I really just use to write code and that's pretty much it. I don't even normally use the debugger. I pretty much just debug by using logs and that's really it. One alternative to that is Visual Studio Code. So this one is a little bit more small, but still very capable. I have used it once when I made one course and I did enjoy working with it, but I just went back to Visual Studio, the regular version. Alternatively, one that a lot of people love is Writer. This one used to be paid, but they recently made a free version. And I've heard a lot of people say a lot of very good things about it. The only reason why I haven't tried it is just because I'm already used to Visual Studio, so I really have no reason to switch. But if I were to switch, I definitely would try Writer, because again, I've heard lots of people talking very good things about it. Then I also use Photoshop for images. Any kind of game that you make will require textures. Even if you are mainly a programmer like myself, you're still going to need to interact with textures, sprites, and so on. And for me, I use Photoshop just because it's what I've used for literally some like 15 years at this point. I just do very basic image manipulation, so really just modifying things, painting on things. So really just super basic stuff. There are some alternatives to Photoshop if you don't like using Adobe products. One example is Krita. I've heard this one is really excellent. This one is free and open source. If you specifically want to make pixelated sprites, if so, then a sprite is something that I've heard lots of very good things about. Then Photopia, this is another one that I've heard great things about. And this one even runs internally just in your browser, so you don't even need to download anything. Or another one that has existed for a very long time is GIMP. This was one of the classics for many, many years. I think nowadays the other alternatives are a bit better, but still, GIMP is still valid, still free, still available. Then I also use Audition for some basic sound effects editing. I use this one very much for some very basic sound effects editing. I am definitely not a sound engineer, sound designer, nope, not at all. I basically just buy sound effects and then I use this to modify them in small ways if I need them, like cutting off some silence at the beginning or at the end. So run just minor modifications to get all kinds of sound effects. And if there you go, this works great for that particular use case. And audio is something that I don't know much about, but I only have one alternative you have is Audacity. I believe this one is free and open source. Or specifically for music, you've got FL Studio. I remember using this back in the day, back in when it was still called Fruit Loop Studio. I'm definitely not a musician, so I couldn't really produce much, but I remember using this back then, it was nice. Some interesting tools, if you want to make your own sound effects is SFXR. If you want to make some chiptune-like sound effects, then this one can be quite helpful. Alternatively, for making music, you've got Bosca Oil. I think that's what it's well. And this one, yep, is a nice, I believe, open source tool for how to make your own music. Chiptone is another great one for making sound effects. This one runs entirely in your browser, and over here, if you know how to play around this, you can definitely create some nice sound effects. Then I use OBS for recording and Premiere for making trailers. So I'm going to talk about this when I talk about my video editing tools. And then maybe Blender for some minor 3D editing. 
And when I say minor, I do really mean very minor. I am definitely not a 3D modeler at all. There was a time when I actually tried learning Blender. I followed the course for about 10 hours and I did manage to learn quite a little bit. I mean, still very, very basic stuff, but I did manage to make some buildings, some cars, some trees, and so on. So yep, I do know the absolute basis of Blender, so if I need to do some very minor tweaks, I can use Blender to modify it. Always remember how any asset that you buy, for example, from the asset store or home bundle, if it is not exactly perfect, if it is not exactly what you need, you can always make some slight tweaks. You probably don't need insane skill to do that. And you can make some assets that are 99% what you need, modify that 1%, make it perfectly match your game. Then I also use U-Motion for editing animations inside Unity. This is a really awesome asset that does exactly that. It lets you animate things directly inside Unity. In case you don't know, Unity by default does not allow you to modify animations. Or rather, humanoid animations. You can't really modify the bones directly inside Unity. But with this tool, you can. So anytime I need to do some slight tweaks on any animations that I buy, again, anything that is like 99% right there, and I really just need that 1%, for those use cases, really just use your motion in order to modify the bones and get the exact animation I need. But of course, if you know Blender, then you can use Blender to edit those animations itself. Like I said, I just use that asset just because I need for some very tiny use case, and for that tiny use case, really just editing directly inside Unity is much simpler. The alternatives to Blender would be something like Autodesk 3ds Max. I did actually use this for a little bit when I was like 15 years old, something like that. I wanted to make some very strange 3D models, but I never really learned too much. Or you also have Maya. Honestly, I don't know the difference between 3ds Max and Maya. I believe those do roughly the same thing, but either way, those are the main two options. But for game dev, Blender is free and very capable, so usually for game dev, that's what a lot of people use, especially indie game devs. And finally for this, I also use Azure for backups. So yep, I definitely recommend you do have some backups, both local backups and remote backups, just in case something terrible happens. So in my case, I have backups of all my games at various stages of progression, and I usually have those both locally, both on my PC on different folders, different drives. I also have it on external hard drives, and I have it on the cloud. So in this specific case, I'm using Azure Storage, but really any cloud provider works. AWS is one of the big ones, so naturally it's got cloud storage. And Google is another one, so you can use Google Cloud to store all kinds of data. In my case, I use Azure just because that's the only one that I know. I did some research a few years ago in order to figure out how it works. And now I really just keep using it just for those basic backups. So if those are really the main tools, and then of course, then I've got pen and paper for game design and task management. So I really always have a pen, I always have a bunch of paper, just a nice notebook for doing any kinds of tasks that I do. Then I've got a whiteboard that I use and I write every single task that I need to do on that specific day. And then maybe a simple notepad text file just to store rough ideas. And for that, I use Notepad++, so that's basically a much more enhanced version of Notepad. Like I said, I really just use that one for writing down some very rough ideas. Something also that I started using relatively recently is Obsidian. And I use it just for one simple reason, just because I can install it on my PC and on my mobile, and I can basically synchronize it between back and forth. So anytime I've got some kind of idea where I'm outside, I really just write a note on my mobile, and really just get synchronized, so when I come back to my PC, I see that note, add it to my task list, and continue working on it. And then something extremely important is what I said here, so then really just working on the game day in, day out. Again, here I'm talking about tools, but of course, you have to actually use those tools if you want to make progress. The perfect tool in the world will not be very useful if you don't actually use it. So making progress day by day, that is the most important thing. Find the right tools and then actually use those tools. So if this is really my game development tech stack, nothing too special. I'm guessing most of you already know and already use pretty much all these tools. And then on the video production side, on this one, I started this YouTube channel all the way back in 2018. That was seven years ago. Since then, I have made over 800 videos. So that's a lot of videos. That's a lot of content, a lot of video editing, a lot of recording. And video production is actually something that I didn't necessarily know too much about. When I was a kid, I used to make Counter-Strike Frag movies, so I didn't learn the absolute basics of video editing when I was very young. And of course, for all of my Steam games, I did have to learn how to make trailers for all those games. I made many games before I started this channel, so I need to know basic video editing basically to make the trailers for these games. But I really only knew the absolute basics. Whereas nowadays, video editing is obviously a very important part of my job, so this is something that I've had to learn how to get good at. So here John asked me, what's your video production tech stack? And also, do you use Unity for any special effects? That's an interesting one. So first of all, I use OBS for screen recording. Oh yes, a really excellent piece of software. Honestly, it's amazing how this is completely free. I believe there are some alternatives, but for the most part, as far as I know, 99% of people use OBS for recording. It is really excellent. Like I said, it's free, so that's really awesome. Then I also use Premiere for editing. So yeah, for all my videos, all of them, I edit them over here in Premiere. And for the most part, I really just make some basic edits. So really just cutting down mistakes and adding visuals that are related to whatever I'm talking about. I definitely don't do any super fancy editing, so I'm definitely not an editing expert. I'm definitely not the right person to teach video editing. What alternative is Sony Vegas? This is actually what I used to use back when I was making those Counter-Strike frag movies. I used Vegas for quite a lot and it worked pretty fine. Nowadays, I don't know if it's good or not. I haven't heard about it in many years. Nowadays, something that a lot of people prefer over Premiere is DaVinci Resolve. This one is used by very professional people and especially by a lot of people that don't want to use Adobe products. Then I also use Photoshop for any images that I need either in the video or for the thumbnails. So yep, like I already said, whatever you're going to do, chances are you need to do some image manipulation. So yep, having any of the programs that I mentioned, Photoshop, GIMP, 
create a photopea pretty much all of those just make sure you find one and you actually learn how to use it in the case of video editing i use it for making all kinds of thumbnails so here i've got my main project i've got all kinds of interesting head poses or whatever that i can use for my thumbnails and then i've got whatever image that i put on that thumbnail and for these images i actually used to try to make them myself so here on my channel if i sort by all this yep this is pretty much the format that i used to build myself so these are all my sprites that i hand drawn myself or actually some of these these were actually hired by an artist to make them for a game but most part for the most part this was all made by myself using my art skills which as you can see are definitely very basic whereas nowadays i would say my thumbnails definitely look quite a bit better or at least they match what the youtube audience expects out of a thumbnail and the way that i do that nowadays using ai tools specifically i use leonard.ai here I can generate all kinds of interesting images that I can then combine with basically my face in order to make the final thumbnail, as long as any minor alterations that I probably need. And now since I'm talking about AI, I have to talk about something very important that everybody always tells me whenever they see that I'm using AI thumbnails. People are always concerned that AI thumbnails are basically taking away someone's job. But the reality is, I used to make thumbnails myself, and I still make them myself, but now I have an extra tool that allows me to make better thumbnails. So in my case, my use of AI did not cause anyone to lose their job. Back when I was making these thumbnails that are definitely not very clickable, back then I was making them myself. And nowadays that I'm making these thumbnails that do have a higher click-through rate, nowadays I am still making them myself, but now I have an extra tool that allows me to produce much better stuff. So I really just wanted to point that out because that is definitely a valid argument. That's definitely a very valid concern. Being concerned that these tools might lead a lot of people to lose their jobs, and I can definitely understand that concern. But in my specific case, that has definitely not happened. Whenever I make a game, like my last game, Dink Guardians, I always hire an artist. So over here, this capsule, this one looks great. This was not AI generated. This was made by an artist. Whenever I want something custom that I need to be good, yep, I'm always going to hire an artist. For my other games, I've also hired artists. Like over here on Hyper Knights, I hired an artist to do pretty much 90% of the sprites on the game. And I was definitely very happy with the result. So anytime that I need some custom sprites, I will always, always hire an artist. But for making thumbnails, AI really is an excellent tool that has helped me out a ton in the past few years. I produce videos very quickly, so I really could not wait two or three days for an artist to come back to me. So like I said, for my workflow, I have to make the thumbnails myself, and I managed to go from this level of quality to this level of quality by just using a really excellent tool. So again, just wanted to clarify that. If you're one of the people who's heavily against AI, I get that, I understand that. But for me personally, my usage of AI has not caused anyone to lose their jobs. I used to make the thumbnails myself, and I still make them myself, but now I have an extra tool that allows me to produce much better quality. Then the other AI tool that I also use myself is ChatGPT. And I use it in ways that you might not know. I don't actually use it for like writing scripts for these videos. I don't use it for writing my tutorials, those sorts of things. No, that pretty much all comes from my brain. So the way that I use it is actually for something like this. Basically, I made a script that takes the auto-generated captions out of Premiere and feeds them onto ChatGPT. And then basically, I just ask it to generate a bunch of things to really help me save a bunch of time. So first of all, just a quick description on the video. So that's the description that I write over here on every single one of my videos. I have ChatGPT auto-generate this, and then of course I edit them myself to make it actually make sense. Then all the timestamps, these are all auto-generated by ChatGPT. This is another super useful thing. A lot of people always ask me for timestamps, but I never really have the time to be able to write them myself. So with this tool, this has been super useful. Then I also ask it to help me come up with some tags. Again, another thing that used to be a very annoying, very time-consuming task that now I can just automate. And then for the thumbnails, I use the other tool in order to actually generate the thumbnail. But I use over here to give me basically a bunch of ideas that I can use to make the various thumbnails. I think one of the best use cases for AI is basically for brainstorming. And that's basically what this gives me. It gives me like 10 ideas of various thumbnails. And then I can just go ahead, pick a bunch of them or mix and match a bunch of them in order to come up with the final thumbnail. This is also how I recommend that you use AI in your own projects, in your own games. You can use it as a brainstorming partner. So anytime you've got some kind of game mechanic idea that you don't know how to implement, Go ahead, ask it, and it will probably give you like 10 different ideas for how you can make that mechanic. And then out of those 10, chances are 5 are going to be very bad. Then maybe 1 or 2 are going to be really good, and 1 or 2 are going to be decent. Then you can basically use your own brain, combine all those in order to figure out what exactly you should do. So in terms of tech, that's mostly it for how I handle video production. And here John also asked to use any Unity for special effects. And I said, I've only used Unity once for some fun effects in my game that report videos. It was fun to record on the green screen, and then use an asset that keyed out Unity, put that video in the video player, and move the camera. So if that's this format that I did a few times, which is actually quite fun to make. And for the virtual production, like this sort of thing, where I'm there in the middle of the chair. Yeah, for this, so basically those nice little animations. For those, I basically used Unity. So basically just had a video player directly inside Unity, then move the camera in order to move it around. So you have just some very slight virtual production, but it was definitely fun to make. And then the final thing is just web development. So this is something that I've technically been making all my life, but at the same time, at a very low level. I started programming when I was 10 years old by making mirror scripts. This was quite a fascinating thing. It was basically a chatbot and you can basically create quite a lot of things, all chat based, but very much you could create a lot of things. And then shortly after that, I learned how you can actually make websites. 
So I learned some super basic HTML. And then I learned how you can make some really interesting server-side scripting. And for that, I used PHP. Back then, I remember I was playing a game called Dark Galaxy. This was a really fascinating game. And it was a web-based game. And in researching how exactly does a game like this gets made, that's when I figured out, oh, there's such a thing called server-side scripting. And that's basically how you can do all kinds of logic on the server and then show it to the user. And then, of course, eventually, I also learned that JavaScript also exists. This is actually back in the day of Ajax. This was something that seemed magical, how you can basically update a web page without having to actually refresh it. So using these three things, basically just HTML, PHP, and JavaScript, I basically learned how to make some basic websites. And then the thing is, basically my web dev knowledge kind of stopped right there. So it kind of stopped, let's say, 15 years ago. And since then, I haven't really kept up. So in terms of web development, I know the very basics, and that's pretty much it. I learned enough to build everything I want to build. So over here, my website does work. It does do everything that I wanted to do. Basically just a repository for all my videos. But I don't know anything about the latest features, the latest modern stuff and so on. I've never used anything like React, Angular, all of those millions of JavaScript frameworks. I really know nothing about that world. Like I said, I really just use basic HTML, basic PHP, basic JavaScript. So keep that in mind as I'm telling you my tool set for web dev. I'm just sharing what I personally use. I'm definitely not saying this is what you should use yourself. If you want to learn web dev, there's tons of content you can find on the internet and I am definitely not the right person to teach that. So that said, yep, here John asks what's my web dev tech stack. And like I said, it's really mostly the same that I learned 20 years ago. So no fancy JavaScript or React or any of those new libraries. It's really mostly PHP with vanilla JavaScript, sometimes jQuery, basic HTML, some MySQL database. Then I use WinSCP for FTP. You have this a really great FTP client. If you need to connect to a server to upload files and so on, then this one works really nice. And then for writing the code, I actually do it in Notepad++ and I write directly to the FTP client so I don't even have a fancy deploy method. So if that's exactly what I said, I use very basic stuff for my web dev. Definitely not the kind of thing that I would recommend for professional web development. But like I said, for my very simple use case, yep, this works perfectly fine. Like I wrote here, so it is definitely not the most professional web dev tech stack. But since my website is basically just a library of my videos, then it works well enough. So yep, this was a fun question to answer. If you yourself were wondering what tools I use, then over here, hopefully I answer them in this video. Having good tools and knowing how to use them is definitely a game changer. So I highly recommend you find tools to help with whatever you're doing. It can be the same ones that I mentioned, or it can be all the various alternatives that I talked about. But yep, definitely make sure you use good tools to make yourself much more productive. So yep, thanks so much to John for asking all these interesting questions. If you're a channel member or a Patreon supporter, you can ask me pretty much any question on the monthly YouTube video. Or I also do my private live streams every single Saturday where I'm there to answer whatever questions you have. Alright, so thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.